so before we could start our uh, main topic i just wanted to have a clinical scenario uh, discussed here so we have a history of a 34 year old woman attends the rheumatology outpatient clinic with six months history of painful hands previously fit and uh, which deteriorated over a few weeks to profound pain and marked stiffness affecting both hands and wrists particularly in the morning uh, her symptoms uh, particularly in the morning her symptoms are now very intrusive uh, her general practitioner has prescribed diclofenac with minimal benefit she is otherwise well but is becoming isolated and depressed she delayed going to her see her general physician because she was concerned that she has de- developed the same rheumatism as her grandmother who was wheelchair dependent so from the history what are the valid points that we need to take into consideration is the patient is having a 6 months history of painful hands and there there is a mild pain in her metacarpophalangeal joints metacarpophalangeal joints and the patient is also having a marked stiffness in the morning in both hands and the wrist so just from the uh, history itself we can clearly uh, say the patient is having uh, small joint pains particularly hand joint pains um, where metacarpophalangeal joints are predominantly painful so from the examination what we can uh, see so the woman is thin and tearful she has marked soft tissue swelling of her wrists and mcp and several proximal interphalangeal joints of both the hands and her reduced grip strength bi- bilaterally and a non tender nodule is also present on the elbow so from the examination we found that it is a uh, the joints are completely tender swollen and also non tender nodule is also present on the elbow so from the history we can see the patient is suffering from arthritis and there is a possibility the patient is also having nodules so just from the history we we got to have few differential diagnosis so before we get into investigations so if we have a set of uh, differential diagnosis from the investigations we can uh, cut down and come to a definitive diagnosis so with an arthritis and nodule so what can be the possible differential diagnosis so to my knowledge rheumatoid arthritis is first one which is most common i would say with arthritis and nodule then rheumatic fever sle gout and we have a a rare disorder multicentric reticulohistiocytosis reticular histocytosis so these can be the possible differential diagnosis for me from the history itself so if i wanted to exclude uh, from the history only uh, the differential diagnosis i have uh, written then yeah we can go with uh, some some points some valid points in rheumatoid arthritis all the points which were discussed will be there uh, from the rheumatic fever the patient should be having any uh, throat infection uh, the history of throat infection or the from the patient with the sle should have a skin manifestations or oral ulcers of photosensitivity which was not mentioned in the history in the gout the patient should be having a history of a monoarticular involvement uh, with acute episode overnight and so these particular uh, diagnosis can be short uh, bring down to a definitive diagnosis from the investigations so what are the investigations that we have to look up to so investigations if you see uh, there is a hemoglobin levels which was decreased possible anemia is present 10.9 and mean corpuscular volume is 85 uh, piloates and white cell count is 7.4 in 10.9 and platelets is 523 into 10.9 and the patient is having plate uh, esr 62 which is elevated crp 94 which is elevated and patient is having rheumatoid factor positive and anti citrullinated peptide antibody is also positive and ana is negative with this ana being negative we can completely eliminate sl and with this rheumatoid factor and anti citrullinated antibody positive the probability of rheumatoid arthritis has increased there is a high chance of the patient can be a rheumatoid arthritis so there is no other investigations given except for an x ray so we will discuss that but as the uh, diagnosis with the investigation suggests rheumatoid arthritis i would like to discuss more in detail about this rheumatoid arthritis so firstly rheumatoid arthritis is a most common chronic inflammatory arthritis and it is a symmetric polyarthritis that means it involves bilateral joints equally 
and multiple joint involvement will be present. And Rodhi's rheumatoid arthritis is also associated with few systemic features. We'll be discussing it in the upcoming minutes. So systemic manifestations will also be there with this rheumatoid arthritis. So when we when we wanted to begin with uh, the rheumatoid arthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, the first point we are concerned with is the age of occurrence of rheumatoid arthritis. This is very important as we see from the age of 25, after the age of 25, the incidence of rheumatoid arthritis will be increasing slowly and it becomes peak at the age of 55 years. And slowly after 60, 65 years, the incidence will be decreasing. And after 75 years of age, the occurrence of rheumatoid arthritis is very, very, very less. And rheumatoid arthritis is more frequently seen in females than in males. And it's not just the reason that it is an autoimmune disorder or it is an uh, inflammatory uh, disease. That's why females are most commonly affected. There is also another reason why rheumatoid arthritis is most commonly seen in females is that there is high levels of estrogen, which is a risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis in females. So this rheumatoid arthritis involves small joints predominantly. The two hand joints, not only just joints, it will also affect tendons and bursa also. So, as we have already mentioned in the beginning that rheumatoid arthritis is a symmetric, symmetric polyarthritis. Can rheumatoid arthritis be monoarthritis? Can it be oligoarthritis? Can it be polyarthritis? Yes, it is polyarthritis. It involves multiple joints. What all joints will be involved, we'll be discussing it. But my question is, will it be uh, oligoarthritis and monoarthritis? Yes, there is a probability of 5 to 10 percent chance of being monoarthritis and 10 to 25 percent chance of becoming a oligoarthritis and this monoarthritis means only one joint involvement and oligoarthritis means less than or equal to four joint involvement and polyarthritis to define we should be having at least more than or five joint involvement so from this if I wanted to discuss about rheumatoid arthritis in short, so in short, if I wanted to discuss rheumatoid arthritis, the entire disease course, I would like to say three important points. So the first point, the patient will be having flexor tenosynovitis of fingers, which is called a trigger finger. Initial presentation can be this. Then the patient might be having joint cartilage destruction. And then finally, over a period of time, over years and years, the patient will be having complete joint deformities as well as systemic involvement as well right so these are the three important points that you need to uh, note in this particular aspect of flexor tenosynovitis joint cartilage destruction and joint deformities with systemic involvement over a period of time but how and why is this happening is my question is my next question so when when we are discussing about rheumatoid arthritis and uh, why any patient would develop rheumatoid arthritis is what we will We'll be discussing so there will be certain risk factors so there will be certain risk factors which leads to the development of rheumatoid arthritis so what can be those risk factors will be very important genetic factors responsible for the development of rheumatoid arthritis so what are these genetic risk factors which will lead to the development of rheumatoid arthritis which is multiple times asked in competitive exams so the first one is HLA 
dr b1 is most common as well as most severe genetical prediction that is associated with rheumatoid arthritis of which which allele of hla dr b1 is most commonly associated with rheumatoid arthritis 0401 is most commonly associated with rheumatoid arthritis as well as other alleles 0101 0301 0301 as well as 0404 is also involved with the rheumatoid arthritis but this is most associated with rheumatoid arthritis or then we also have cd40 involvement then we have stat4 gene involvement and we have pad4 enzyme is also one of the risk factors resulting in development of rheumatoid arthritis but how is this pad4 is an enzyme that will result in development of rheumatoid arthritis and what is this pad something about peptide arginine dmnase type 4 enzyme it has a property of converting in uh, arginine in our body to citrulline now our body will recognize citrulline as a foreign antigen or citrulline protein as a foreign antigen and resulting in development of resulting in immune system activation and against this citrulline and tccp antibodies that is anti citrullinated cyclical citrullinated protein or cyclical citrullinated peptide antibodies will be developed and what are the environmental risk factors the second trigger factors or the risk factors for the development of uh, rheumatoid arthritis will be environmental factors so of this very very important environmental risk factor is smoking smoking and, and the next one will be epstein bar virus one virus which results in development of rheumatoid arthritis is epstein bar virus and one bacteria that results in development of rheumatoid arthritis possible uh, uh, risk factor for the development of rheumatoid arthritis will be porphyromonas gingivalis so this porphyromonas gingivalis results in development of periodontitis and it is the only bacteria which has pad4 enzyme activity in itself and due to this as we have already discussed there will be development of anti ccp antibodies which results in the rheumatoid arthritis yes but we have to know uh, the immunological basics of how rheumatoid arthritis is being uh, initiated in our body from these risk factors so with that i just wanted to uh, discuss very 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 important pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis so knowing the basics in medicine is very very important for us to understand the disease process and for us to understand the clinical manifestations and for us to understand how we have to treat right from uh, this particular basics we can tell all of those things so first and foremost thing from the pathogenesis as we have already discussed we have risk factors both genetic as well as environmental risk factors are present in the patient so these risk factors will be activating the antigen presenting cells so antigen presenting cells will be present which will be having cd28 receptor and we have toll like receptor for this antigen presenting cells and we also have mhc class 2 by binding receptors so with this what happens is that immediately cd4 t cell mhc class 2 will be representing i mean will be activating or attaching to cd4 t cells and activates it so this cd4 t cell will be having a receptor cd8 
and also T cell receptor will also be present. So this CD4 T cell will be activating the subtype T helper one cell, and it will also be activating T helper seventeen cell. So what is this cells and why we have to discuss it? So this particular T helper seventeen cell have a ligand CD40 which has a property of uh, uh, for activating the B cells because B cell which is present will be having a receptor for this CD40. So the B cell will be activating this uh, sorry T helper one cell will be activating the B cell. Now the B cell will be activating the plasma cell. So these plasma cells has a ability to produce antibodies. By the way, what are those antibodies? Those antibodies are nothing but rheumatoid factor and also anti-CCP antibodies. And this rheumatoid factor also, which class of antibody will be generated? IgM will be the most common antibody that is generated what these two will do these antibodies will not be silent they will go and trigger complement pathway in our body both classical and alternate pathways will be activated complement pathway and eventually what happens this complement pathway will be maxima maximizing the inflammatory pathology in the body leading to the development of rheumatoid arthritis now, apart from just activating the B cell, this same T helper one cell has a property of activating or property of releasing alpha, beta, gamma. What is this alpha, beta, gamma? Alpha is TNF alpha. Beta is lymphotoxin beta and gamma is interferon gamma. So these are also the the inflammatory mediators which will activate the inflammatory uh, process in the body we will discuss that also but before that what does this t helper 17 is doing here this particular t helper 17 cell is releasing interleukin 6 cytokine interleukin 17 and also gmcsf these are also uh, uh, the inflammatory cytokines, which is having a property of damaging our bones, cartilage, and sinus, but how is the question? But before we can discuss how, there is another important uh, cell that is participating in this pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis is T effector cell. So, what happening? What is happening with this T effector cell? The first and foremostly, this T effector cell will be activating the fibroblasts in the body. This fibroblast has a property of releasing FGF and TGF beta. Obviously, what do they do? They has fibrosing activating or stimulating or uh, you know uh, augmenting the fibrosis in our body. But it is all these both will also have a property of activating MMP, which is nothing but matrix metalloproteinase. This matrix metalloproteinase proteinase is an enzyme which will cleave the synovial matrix and also cartilage. Synovial matrix and also cartilage. This is how the cartilage cleaving and synovial damage has started with this pathogenesis. So that's where we'll be discussing about the synovial inflammation and also cartilage damage from here. But there is another very important property of T effector cell. What is it? It will be releasing interleukin 17 and also interferon gamma. Both of them has a property. If you could remember, both of them has a property of activating macrophage. So this macrophage will be releasing the very, very important cytokines. In interleukin 15, interleukin 6, TNF alpha, GMCSF. Remember this TNF alpha, this is the major culprit in rheumatoid arthritis, but how and why we will be discussing. But before that, this macrophage has also the property of activating fibroblasts by releasing interleukin 1, 6, 12, 15 and 18. 
so these cytokines will be activating fibroblasts so this is also like a vicious cycle one is activating another one another one is also activating another one resulting in the damage of uh, the synovium cartilage and so on now what i said remember uh, tnf alpha why and what is happening here is that so the tnf alpha has the following properties what is that first thing is that it, it will increase the movement of leukocytes or more and more amount of macrophages to the joint so when more and more macrophages are being driven to the joint what happens more and more fibroblasts will be activated more and more cytokines will be released and more and more tissue damage will be present and this is also having a property of activating wnt which is a uh, wnt like uh, wnt protein which is having a property of activating pre osteoblast which has a property of activating osteoblast but more than that this t in the alpha is activating dkk1 which is nothing but dkof1 protein which has inhibitory property on wnt and so it prevents uh, osteoblastic activation this D dkk1 and also this same tnf alpha has very very important property of activating rank ligand on on the osteoblast not only just tnf alpha not only just tnf alpha the fibroblasts which are activated previously also has a positive influence on the rank ligand and also the general stromal cell in the body is in our body will also have a positive influence on this rank ligand and this osteoclast you know everyone osteoclast is responsible for bone resorption right so this is responsible for bone resorption but how is the question so this osteoclast has uh, will be releasing cd68 catapsin catapsin k trap tartarate resistant acid phosphatase very important tartarate resistant acid phosphatase and there will be activation of calcitonin receptor in the body all together will result in cleaving of the collagen or bone matrix collagen and bone matrix resulting in the damage of or we can say bone erosions so this is how the bony erosions are happening this is how the bony erosions in the rheumatoid arthritis are happening this round basics for that so who if you wanted an additional information who can stop this rank ligand we have an opg that is nothing but osteoprotegerin which will be inhibiting the rank ligand and also inhibiting the bone resorption so we have discussed that how the synovial matrix is damaged and synovial inflammation cartilage damage is occurring and how the bone damage is also occurring but from the question we have earlier discussed we have a nodule also can this how uh, which pathogenesis which pathogenesis the point uh, which point in the pathogenesis is justifying the uh, development of nodules so this one the leukocytes are being driven to the joints not only joints anywhere in the body there will be activation of more and more lymphoid follicles due to the inflammatory pathology of the cytokines that is being released and more and more leukocytes being driven lymphoid follicles will be highly activated and these lymphoid follicles during acute inflammation or over chronic inflammation will result in development of a nodule that is only called as our very famous rheumatoid nodule so now we know why the patient is complaining of pain why the patient is complaining of nodules 
just from the pathogenesis itself. So now we'll be moving on to the pathological uh, changes that happen due to this process at the bone level, right? So as we move on to the pathological changes that have uh, happened at the bone level, the first one will be affected will be what? We have a bone. The ligaments or tendons the first level we'll be talking about is the synovium so synovium is nothing but a connective tissue layer surrounding the joints or the bones so this synovium has two types of cells type a and type b why i am going at this particular basic level is that if you wanted to understand the uh, the examination findings in a rheumatoid arthritis patient or if you wanted to understand the radiological changes that have occurred or if you wanted to remember the radiological changes happening in rheumatoid arthritis you have to know these basic points so type a uh, synovial cells are present and type b synovial cells are also present type a synovial cells are originating or derived from macrophages so they are protective in nature whereas type b synovial cells are uh, originating from fibroblasts so these fibroblasts are abundantly present at the synovium in the normal synovium and these fibroblasts will be secreting or producing collagen laminin fibronectin all these will be giving support to the joint and the synovium supporters i can say they are supporters and also the synovium which i have shown at the bone level have a a layer of blood vessels so what is this layer of blood vessels doing they will be continuously seeping the plasma into the joint space and that plasma is nothing but synovial fluid this synovial fluid mainly has two things hyaluronan which is responsible for the viscosity maintenance of synovial fluid and we have lubricin in the same synovial fluid for lubrication of the joints right so whenever there is an inflammatory pathology going on at this synovial level and cytokines and uh, inflammatory mediators are uh, dumping into the synovial fluid this hyaluronan will be damage and this lubricin will be uh, damaged resulting in the loss of viscosity and also lubrication more and more friction more and more joint damage so from this particular basic points i can say the pathological hallmarks of rheumatoid arthritis that you should remember for your exam as well as for the clinical points are the first one synovitis which is nothing but synovial inflammation second one thinning of cartilage third one focal bony erosions so the occurrence of these pathological hallmarks will be present in the same order that i have said synovitis thinning of cartilage and focal bony erosions so these will be particularly seen in acute episodes of rheumatoid arthritis but over a period of time what happens is that chronic inflammation will be present this chronic inflammation will result in synovial thickening how can we say there is a synovial thickening because the synovium is getting deposited with granulomatous reactive fibrosin tissue and this is nothing but our panus the thickened synovium is called as panus so now what happens 
to the catalyst first we will be discussing the synovium we have done it then we'll be moving on to the catalyst now what is happening to the catalyst so again we have a bone and a cartilage covering the bony surface and this cartilage will be or chronic inflammation generally in a normal cartilage is usually avascular and painless and it is mainly filled with collagen and peptidoglycans and there will be chondrocytes which will make up this cartilage so whenever there is inflammatory pathology or the chronic inflammation is coming and attacking this uh, interleukin uh, tnf alpha all these are coming and attacking these uh, collagen peptidoglycans and chondrocytes there will be thinning of cartilage along with thinning of cartilage along with subchondral changes are also present subchondral erosions that means whatever macrophages or whatever cells or inflammatory mediators are coming they will be drilling into the cartilage resulting in thinning and damaging the cartilage as well as the subchondral changes will also be present in the patient so now the cartilage is over we'll be moving on to another point is that uh, where will uh, the point that is asked in as an mcq is that where does the uh, cartilage damage begin cartilage damage begins at the site of panus cartilage interaction so this is the site where the cartilage damage begins that is panus cartilage junction and as we move on to the damage to the bone right bone damage so there is synovial damage is over sino from the synovium the disease process is getting into the cartilage and subchondral now what is happening to the bone so as we have already discussed right so bone is being damaged by the osteoclasts that are activated by tnf alpha right osteoclasts are activated by releasing cd68 and cathepsin k and uh, uh, tartar resistant acid phosphatase there will be uh, earliest important question multiple times asked earliest change which can be seen on which can be seen radiologically uh, is that peri articular osteopenia is the one that is what we will be looking into periarticular osteopenia and there will be slowly slowly over chronic uh, uh, inflammation resulting in decrease in the joint space between the uh, two uh, joints i mean two bony surfaces as well as uh, the next important thing will be marrow bone marrow will be having edema the inflammation of the bone marrow edema is present and there will be osteoids deposition as well as osteoblast activation is also present and there is also the in the marrow itself the trabecular bone thinning is also present so this marrow changes can be appreciated with mri and we'll be discussing it and we discuss about the investigations that we do in rheumatoid arthritis so from here the marrow the trabecular bone which is present in the center of the bone will also be damaged so cortical thinning will be present trabecular bone thinning is present or trabecular bone destruction is present and there will be edema of the marrow due to inflammatory process osteo deposition and there is osteoblastic deposition and uh, there is periarticular osteopenia which is earliest change of the bone so these are the earliest features that can be observed but the late features are joint deformities and joint destruction so when we wanted to discuss about that joint deformities and also joint destruction we have to know before we get into the joint destruction and the joint deformities we have to know the constitutional symptoms that we see in the rheumatoid arthritis so due to the constant inflammatory uh, process that is going on in the body the patient constantly uh, complains of fever why because there is interleukin 1 circulating highly in the body then we have myalgia malaise 
फैटिग एंड डिप्रेशन सो इफ यू कुड सी दैट दीज फीचर्स वर मेन्शनड इन आर एर्ली डिस्कस्ड क्वेश्चन right so the patient is having depression due to the inflammatory mediators only the inflammation itself is resulting in all this so the fever which we are discussing if it progresses to more than 101 degrees fahrenheit definitely you have to suspect some infection at the joint or vasculitis is also present at the patient so these are the constitutional symptoms that will be present and now we will be discussing the very important joint deformities so as before we discuss the joint deformities the primary clinical uh, points or clinical features the patient complains is joint pains right patient complains of stiffness but this stiffness is more than 30 to 1 hour 30 minutes to 60 minutes and eases it becomes normal after exercise this is a very very important point with regard to uh, rheumatoid arthritis in order to diagnose or say rheumatoid arthritis and what other conditions we can see this stiffness that is somewhere around 30 minutes to 60 minutes is that that is also important not just like uh, only in entire universe only rheumatoid arthritis will be having stiffness for 30 minutes to 60 minutes no there is ankylosing spondylitis and also spondylo other spondylo arthritis will also be having the same kind of stiffness we'll be discussing that in our next classes about these both the th these both things but the next point i'll be wanting to discuss is the joint pains should be present for more than 6 weeks which is very very important point for you in the history in order to consider uh, that the patient might be having inflammatory arthritis okay so the patient should be having this constitutional symptoms patient should be complaining joint pain for more than 6 weeks to consider it as inflammatory arthritis if the patient is having the same constitutional symptoms and the joint pains are less than 6 weeks and there is no stiffness is present we consider it as mechanical arthritis due to anything it can be due to occupational hazards or some heavy uh, things that the patient have lifted that day can result in this mechanical arthritis for certain short duration of time only they can be self limiting uh, at times so now uh, the joint deformities that i want to discuss the first and foremost thing that you will be observing is if you could see this image ulnar deviation with joints subluxation subluxation is nothing but loosening of the joints ready to dislocate kind of but not dislocated the second one will be swan neck deformity second one is swan neck deformity where pip joint pip joint is hyper extended and dip joint is flexed now the question you should be getting so we have said that the patient is having rheumatoid arthritis patient is having small joint pain that to particularly hand joint pains are usually present but all the joints of the hand are affected no that's where the catch the patient will be having wrist involvement mcp involvement metacarpophalangeal joints pip involvement is present small joints there is no dip if the question has dip you can forget rheumatoid arthritis but you can ask me why there is flexion of dip joint if dip is not involved it is mainly due to the uh, pip joint the tendon that is present over the pip is pulling this dip joint resulting in flexion so that is the reason that's why otherwise it's completely a normal joint dip joint involvement then we have the next deformity joint deformity we can discuss is bout boutonnieres deformity 
So this bowden is deformity. What is happening here is that there will be flexion at the PAP and hyperextension at the DAP. It is also same the tendon C. If you could clearly see the interosseous muscle tendons are pulling uh, the DAP, resulting in the hyperextension. So DAP will be having hyperextension and PAP will be having flexion. Right. So these will be classically seen in the case of rheumatoid arthritis patient. So the next important joint deformity that we can discuss is the jetline deformity. What is this jetline deformity? First MCP subluxation. First MCP joint subluxation will be present in the jetline deformity. And the next importantly, what are the large joints that we can see? Large joints that are affected in the rheumatoid arthritis. We have knee joint, we have shoulder joint. Very rarely or not at all, the patient uh, hip joint and elbow joint are involved. Large joints are these are the ones which are uh, affected. And characteristically, sometimes second MCP is tender, swollen, which appears predominantly than any other small joints first. So second MCP joint can be tender and swollen and sometimes remember that point. And next importantly, feet involvement is also present, which is very, very important in the feet. First, it will involve metatarsophalangeal joint. It can be any metatarsophalangeal joint, not just first metatarsophalangeal joint. First, it will involve, no confusion here. First, it will involve metatarsophalangeal joint. Then it will involve ankle. Then it will involve the mid tarsal joints. Mid tarsal joints. So, after affecting the mid tarsal joints, the patient will be having plus planus valgus deformity. This plus planus valgus is also called as flat foot. Flat foot. Then, what part of the vertebra this rheumatoid arthritis is affected? Cervical is the most common vertebra that is affected by rheumatoid arthritis. That too, C1, C2, Atlanto, axial subluxation is present in the patients. So what happens whenever the C2, C1, C2, Atlanto, sub, uh, Atlanto axial subluxation is present, there is a high chance that cord is compressed at that particular level and patient will be developing cervical compressive myelopathy. Now, chronic inflammatory rheumatoid arthritis patient, cervical compressive myelopathy is one of the strongest CNS complications that, that you will encounter. Right. These are the joint deformities, articular manifestations that are classically present in the rheumatoid arthritis patient. If we, we have ulnar deviation with joint uh, subluxations, uh, and particularly bridge joint involvement, MCP joint, PAP involvement, chronic deformity, boutness deformity, and we have jetline deformity, we have large joint involvement, knee and shoulder, feet involvement, flat foot, cervical vertebrae, atlanta axial subluxation is also present in the patients. And next we'll be moving on to the extra articular manifestations, which is very, 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 very important in rheumatoid arthritis. A lot of MCQs have been asked from these uh, extra articular manifestations. So what are those? Let's discuss in a simplified manner and understandable manner, extra articular features. So with these extra articular features, first one, first organ that I wanted to talk about is the skin. The skin manifestations in rheumatoid arthritis will be three important skin manifestations are present. One is rheumatoid nodule. Two, pyoderma gangrenosum.
and three is papura right of this the most common will be rheumatoid nodule but how is it appearing the rheumatoid nodule it is a subcutaneous nodule first point it is a subcutaneous nodule is it tender no it is a non tender subcutaneous nodule right so we have discussed the pathogenesis how these nodules are developing right so these non tender subcutaneous nodules most commonly present on present in the forearm then sacrum then ankle why only they are predominantly forearm sacrum and ankle they are highly frictioned areas these are highly frictioned areas and that is why these nodules are usually predominantly present there okay and the next point is that these nodules these rheumatoid nodules can be present on the peritoneum pleura and pericardium as well but less in stem less than 2% and these subcutaneous nodules are also not usually present in all the rheumatoid arthritis positive patients it is only present in those patients 25% of the patients with ra factor positive ra factor positive patients with high disease activity only these patients only you will be finding subcutaneous non tender nodules that is rheumatoid nodules not in all the rheumatoid arthritis patients okay next second organ that i want to discuss is lung four important manifestations that are usually seen in rheumatoid arthritis associated lung manifestations are first one pleural effusion second one interstitial lung disease then we have pulmonary nodules then we have pulmonary vasculitis these are the most four important pulmonary manifestation that are usually seen in the rheumatoid arthritis of which the most common is pleuritis associated pleural effusion and this pleural effusion is most pleuritis associated pleural effusion is the most common manifestation in rheumatoid arthritis associated lung uh, disease and this pleural effusion is always exudative type and this pleural effusion will be having increased monocyte and also neutrophils right and the ild which we see the ild which we see it the patient can develop uip that is called as usual interstitial pneumonitis interstitial pneumonia or nsip non specific interstitial pneumonia but how can you differentiate these both should be very very importantly discussed because inter, uh, because interstitial lung disease is one of the devastating or uh, dreading complication that can develop in a rheumatoid arthritis right so the uip patient will be having the lower lobe of the lung is predominantly affected lower lobe of the lung and the patient will be having fibrous scarring thin fibrous scarring is present with honeycomb peripheral pattern honeycomb periphery of the lung is usually seen in the in usual interstitial pneumonia whereas when it comes to the nsap we can clearly see the bilateral ggos are usually present in the patient and we can clearly see reticular thin reticular reticulations are usually present in the patients where these patients will be having decreased lung volumes as well as fraction bronchitis these are the major lung changes that can occur in the 
rheumatoid arthritis associated lung disorder so the patient will be having a dlco decrease and total lung capacity is also decreased this picture is seen where this picture is particularly seen in the restrictive type of lung pathology restrictive pattern so as we have discussed that rheumatoid arthritis and ald both together are always devastating we should have an aggressive disease uh, management so what treatment that you can give in this uh, both uh, you have to go for high dose very high dose glucocorticoids plus azathioprin or mycophenolate moftin this is uh, and there is another drug that is rituximab as well so any of these three can be used here whenever there is rheumatoid arthritis ild association is present i just want you to remember this particular point here itself because uh, it's very commonly uh, seen condition where lung involvement with ild and rheumatoid arthritis so uh, next we'll be moving on to the next organ involvement is heart when it comes to heart pericardium involvement is present and we have myocardium involvement is also present inflammation attacking both pericardium myocardium resulting in pericarditis and myocarditis and the patient can also develop cardiomyopathy and patient has erythemias particularly ventricular erythemias may develop in the patients and most common cause of death in rheumatoid arthritis is mainly due to the cardiac involvement that too ischemic heart disease cad will develop mi with the patient may die with mi and uh, valvular lesion that is very commonly seen in rheumatoid arthritis related heart disorder is mitral regurgitation the direct points that are very important with related to extraarticular manifestations and this rheumatoid arthritis is also associated with secondary jogren syndrome but how can you say there is a difference between secondary jogren syndrome rheumatoid arthritis associated secondary jogren syndrome and also direct primary jogren syndrome is that very very importantly there is no uvit seen in the rheumatoid arthritis associated secondary jogren syndrome but what will be present the patient will be having sicca keratoconjunctivitis sicca and the patient will be having episcleritis episcleritis scleritis xerostomia and peri odontitis these are the only features that you can observe in the patient with rheumatoid arthritis and jogren syndrome okay that's fine then what is the next organ involvement that we could uh, appreciate in the rheumatoid arthritis is that vascular manifestation so very very importantly in vascular before we could say the uh, vascular manifestation there is a peculiar uh, thing happens if vascular involvement there in rheumatoid arthritis that is rheumatoid factor positive anti ccp negative hypo complementinemia so this can be completely diverting you from the diagnosis where anti ccp negative hypo complementinemia because in the pathogenesis we have discussed that complement pathway is highly activated but the patient is having hypo complementinemia here these things will result in what these things will result in petechiae purpura hand fingers infarction or gangrene will be developed right and how you can treat the patient here you can treat with immuno suppressive drugs what immuno suppressive drugs that can be used i will be discussing at the management part but i just want you to remember here and skin grafting as well for this point i have mentioned it here only skin grafting and vascular involvement due to involvement of vascular uh, vascular changes are also present in rheumatoid arthritis there will be sensory motor polyneuropathy is also present in these patients very very important so the next involvement is what blood involvement when it comes to blood associated with rheumatoid arthritis 
there is different changes early in the disease as well as late in the disease so many of you know the late involvement what is the late involvement many of you know felty syndrome right 100 times mcq asked and you will definitely know what is felty syndrome obviously rheumatoid arthritis sclerosis and neutropenia is a classical triad for rheumatoid arthritis sorry classical triad for felty syndrome now what is happening with the early changes so if our mcq is asked what will be the early uh, hematological changes are uh, seen in the uh, patient with rheumatoid arthritis and uh, there is an option felty syndrome you will definitely mark felty syndrome because many of you might not know the early changes the early changes are anemia splenomegaly rheumatoid arthritis and very importantly t cell large granular leukemia can also develop in this way, uh, early in rheumatoid arthritis so the anemia which is present here is mainly due to anemia of chronic disease right so the patient will also be having late malignancy that can be observed in rheumatoid arthritis will be diffuse large b cell lymphoma is very very important question that is asked multiple times diffuse large b cell lymphoma is the b cell lymphoma that appears late whereas the t cell large granular leukemia will be developing early if, if the question is concerned with the t cells go with this if the question is concerned with the b cells go with this if the question is concerned with the late go with this so these are the hematological changes that we can see in the patients and we have already discussed the patient will be having osteoporosis uh the osteoporosis which we see in the rheumatoid arthritis either it can be due to inflammation the chronic inflammation the patient is having right one is chronic inflammation but another one is the chronic usage of glucocorticoids chronic uh, chronic uses of glucocorticoids can also lead to osteoporosis that is why uh, whenever we are we are ready to give chronic uh, glucocorticoids on a low dose to any patient with rheumatoid arthritis you should also give a supplemented uh, bisphosphonates right we'll discuss that in the management but uh, what else can we see uh, there is also hypoandrogenism which is also very important point that you need to uh, look into hypoandrogenism why there will be hypoandrogenism again due to chronic inflammation there will be decreased dihydro epiandrogenidians and also decreased testosterone in the body this is why there will be uh, hypoandrogenism will be present in the patients okay so these are the total extra articular manifestations and the articular manifestations that we have discussed but what we are going to discuss next will be very important for you to understand the entire disease process and also will be um, very clear for you to look into the investigation that you need to do and also the treatment protocols so the first and foremost thing uh, the disease course if you wanted to understand uh, in the rheumatoid arthritis there will be three phases of disease course is present the first one will be genetic and environmental factors right second thing will be rheumatoid factor positive ccp antibodies are also positive but there is no synovial or articular manifestations and third phase will be the patient will be having synovitis the patient will be having arthritis and also systemic manifestation if you wanted to remember rheumatoid arthritis in short the disease course is just this right next we have very important criteria in order to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis and also very important recommendations in order to look into the rheumatoid arthritis disease process so what is that criteria and also what is the disease process ular recommendation is what you need to 
know both of them what is ulr recommendations in rheumatoid arthritis so we have a again genetic factors have to be looked for b environmental factors c systemic manifestations in the rheumatoid arthritis d symptoms are present but no arthritis e unclassified arthritis this is asked multiple times this ular recommendations are asked multiple times in the initiate recently in order to make you confuse between ular criteria and ular recommendations so e is unclassified arthritis and uh, f is for classified arthritis that means bilateral symmetrical involvement classical small joint involvement that is what classified arthritis so then what is ular criteria many of you know what is ular criteria or ular ACR criteria first point is joint involvement one large joint involvement is zero points two to ten large joint involvement is one point two to three small joint involvement is two points and more than ten small joints there will be five points then we have serology that is rheumatoid factor and ccp anti ccp negative zero rheumatoid factor positive ccp is also positive but low positive that is only one plus then one point and rheumatoid factor and ccp high positive then two points then we have acute phase reactants that is esr crp normal zero points esr crp elevated one point and duration of the disease is the fourth important point that we need to consider in the ular criteria as we have already discussed in order to say it is an inflammatory arthritis more or less uh, we need to have more than six weeks if it is less than six weeks zero and more than six weeks it will be one so for all the points if you calculate and the ular criteria comes to more than six points then it is rheumatoid arthritis but very 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 importantly you need to understand what are the joints that should be excluded from the this criteria what are the joints that are excluded from this criteria are that first mcp joint yes first dip joint and first mtp joint is also excluded from this criteria if they are involved primarily you can exclude them and count the other joints that is what it means so exclude these joints and then calculate the points okay so this is ular criteria next we'll be discussing about the investigative processes to be done in a case of rheumatoid arthritis so when we wanted this first i wanted to go for an x-ray obviously second i'll be going for don't worry i'll discuss x-ray also but there is an image in the next slide so before going to next slide, i just want to discuss about the synovial fluid analysis also so when we have synovial fluid analysis it is very important because the uh, active inflammation or acute inflammation at the joint can be assessed uh, from the synovial fluid analysis by increased polymorphonuclear neutrophils as well as wbcs will be somewhere around 5000 to 50000 it should be below 50000 only but wbcs will be 5000 to 50000 so this will be the differentiating feature here differentiating feature with whom differentiating feature with osteoarthritis because the wbcs and synovial fluid analysis of osteoarthritis will be less than 2000 uh, and uh, there will be uh, how do you differentiate it from gout you all know gout will be having negative birefringent uh, needle shaped crystals okay as well as in cpp cppd or pseudo gout there will be positive birefringent rhomboid crystals 
right so these are the differentiating uh, from the uh, synovial fluid analysis itself but in the synovial fluid analysis also there is a characteristic uh, things which we can see is ragocytes or we can also say rheumatoid arthritis cells nothing but inflammatory cells and inclusion body cells i didn't get a proper image of these uh, cells on internet so i couldn't show you but uh, next we'll be discussing about the x ray which is very 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 important x ray is the primary thing that we need to see so in the x ray we can clearly see periarticular osteopenia periarticular osteopenia can be seen in the patients and there is also massive decrease in the joint space between each joint so we can clearly see here this decrease in the joint space and the destruction subchondral destruction and also bone resorption has started already here okay so what are the points that we can see uh, on an x ray of osteo sorry rheumatoid arthritis is that early change will be periarticular osteopenia and we can say decreased joint space and we have subchondral erosions are also seen in the patients but all these things are primarily seen at mcp wrist and pap if you could see this is normal this is normal those are dfs right this is seen in the early disease what we can see at the late disease nothing but joint deformity joint deformity joint destruction joint destruction and also collapse of the joints can be seen and that x ray is here all the points that we have seen or see we can clearly see what is the deformity we can clearly see flexion of pap hyper extension of pap we can clearly see boutness deformity here complete joint destroyed here here also right next investigation of investigation that i wanted to discuss is mri why mri because it will identify the inflammatory process faster inflammation can be identified very faster right so what is that inflammatory process that we can appreciate here is that synovitis tenosynovitis and joint effusions joint effusions joint effusions can also be appreciated in the same way as we have already discussed mri is the investigation of choice for marrow edema which is an indication for early inflammation so in the early why we have to i'm saying early 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 why we have to go for early because if we start if you diagnose or if we identify rheumatoid arthritis uh, early we can start aggressive management in order to prevent this thing to happen that is why we have to identify rheumatoid arthritis as early as possible in any patient right so this is ultrasonography in a case of rheumatoid arthritis and this is particularly not the b mode ultrasonography that we use it is a muscle musculoskeletal usg with power doppler which will have the power of this this particular ultrasonography will identify the synovial inflammation that is what here is it is being shown here synovial inflammation that means that power doppler will be identifying the high vascularity increased vascularity or high vascularity will be appreciated and also we can see multiple erosions at a time can be appreciated even at the early stages only we can identify this multiple erosions can be appreciated from this ultrasonography that is why we are using ultrasonography if we don't want to go for an mri okay so these are the investigative uh, investigations that you need to do in a case of rheumatoid arthritis that is x ray of the small joints where the uh, changes of early 
uh, periarticular rostropenia and there is a decreasing joint spaces and subcontral erosions are also present in the patients and the late will be joint deformities and joint destruction and collapse is present whereas in the MRI it is mainly for early identification of inflammation whereas in the ultrasonography we will be identifying the synovial vascularity increase and synovial fluid analysis to be also done and in synovial fluid uh, analysis one point is that in a rheumatoid arthritis patient a synovial fluid analysis there is a high chance of uh, direct infection with uh, mycoplasma right and HIV and B19 parvo virus. These are the three important infections that can directly infect the synovial fluid in a rheumatoid arthritis patient. Remember that point also. And next, we'll be uh, discussing the very important treatment protocols. Right. I think so far so good everyone are able to understand so the treatment protocol is mainly depending on the das 28 yes die scoring disease activity index and c die and rapid 20 rapid 3 these are the disease severity indexes These are the disease severity indexes in order to assess the disease process as well as what treatment we have to start. But these are not specific because one lack, lacking point in the these disease severity indexes is that the patient's uh, examination is not present. Examining the joints, examining the joint is not possible in this severity index. So, uh, initially, as the patient complains of the pain, NSAID will be the temporary relief uh, that to naprosin is immediate action drug that can be given, right, naproxen. Then we have glucocorticoids, which are the mainstay uh, management in the early disease process of rheumatoid arthritis, but always and always in a rheumatoid arthritis, we will be starting DMARDs at any cost. So, so before we start DMARDs, if we start glucocorticoids, that is low dose prednisone. Prednisone is started because it takes at least one to two weeks for the DMARDs to show its action. So we can't keep the patient to suffer in these two weeks. So we'll be giving glucocorticoids on a low dose. But whenever there is an acute flare, so whenever there is an acute flare of rheumatoid arthritis, you have to go for high dose glucocorticoids. There is no damage. But if you wanted to go for a chronic uh, therapy of glucocorticoids, that's when you have to go for low dose. That too, 5 to 10 mg of prednisone to be given in the patients. Because, because we have used DMRDs which are showing the reaction, lower action of DMRDs. So lower action of DMRDs, that is why we are going for the chronic glucocorticoid uses. So as we have already said that, if you are using chronic glucocorticoid, uh, chronically glucocorticoids, then we have to go for IV bisphosphonates or oral bisphosphonates, both can be treated. Or oral bisphosphonates should be given, given to the patients in order to prevent osteoporosis. Because osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammation, inflammation, there is a high chance of practice, multiple problems at it. So now we'll be discussing the DMRDs, very, 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 very important DMRDs and that too, synthetic DMRDs are present in the patient. Synthetic DMRDs are present in the patient. Then we also have the biological DMRDs are also present. So what will be the synthetic DMRDs? They are nothing but methotrexate, which is most commonly used DMARD and very efficacious that we can say. So this efficacy uh, can be attained by using 10 to 25 mg per week of methotrexate can be used and 1 mg of folic acid daily to be used except on the day methotrexate is being given. This can be used. So methotrexate can be used as a monodrug or it can be used as a combination drug for other, along with other drugs. What is the next one? HCQ is used. HCQ is 200 to 400 mg per day can be used. And this HCQ can be used along with the methotrexate or uh, this can be used initially or in the early disease as a monodrug. And this is having a side effect of irreversible retinitis. Irreversible retinitis. 
So what happens uh, with the other drugs? We have leflunamide, right? 10 to 20 mg per day can be used. And we have sulfasalazine. So the sulfasalazine is used as 500 mg BD per oral initially. But later on, maintenance dose to be given at a rate of 1 gram to 1.5 grams. Yes, you heard it right. 1 gram to 1.5 grams per oral BD dose to be given for the sulfasalazine to work properly. Now, what happens is that the first line, the protocol I am discussing, the treatment protocol I am discussing, I think you need to be uh, hearing it very, very, very carefully. If you encounter rheumatoid arthritis, this is how you have to manage. So, first line protocol will be the patient should be given with uh, glucocorticoids plus methotrexate for about three to six months and see the disease process. Most of the patients will undergo remission with this glucocorticoids and methotrexate if we diagnose the rheumatoid arthritis early and we start the treatment aggressively. Right, painkillers, NSAIDs are also given as an agent to management, but glucocorticoids plus methotrexate for six months. If there is a response is present, if response is present, continue the same low dose glucocorticoids and NSAIDs. If there is no response, that's when you have to go for second line management. Second line management protocol. What is the second line management protocol? That is nothing but methotrexate plus biological DMRDs. Of the biological DMRDs, most commonly used is TNF alpha inhibitors. Now I will be telling you what is this TNF alpha inhibitors. Now the TNF alpha inhibitors are nothing but infliximab, golimumab. Sarctolizumab, Etanercept, are the four important uh, TNF alpha inhibitors that can be given along with the methotrexate, which is having very, very good efficacy if the uh, methotrexate glucocorticoid therapy is not functioning. So uh, there are some studies and articles where only TNF alpha inhibitors have been started whenever there is systemic manifestations or articular, severe articular manifestations are present. There is a good outcome with the TNF alpha inhibitors, uh, but when methotrexate is given, uh, double the good outcome has been observed from the recent studies. So if the TNF, uh, and also be, be very careful while using TNF alpha inhibitors, because whenever a patient is having a latent uh, TB, or patient is having hep B or C or congestive heart failure or patient is hypersensitive to TNF alpha, you need to avoid TNF alpha inhibitors and go for some other biological DMRD along with the methotrexate. Okay, this you have to observe. So, what other DMRDs that we can give in this patient? So, other DMRDs will be we have lots of fever and interleukin 1 inhibitor, Nkinara can be given in the patient. Right. Then we can go for interleukin 6 inhibitor tocilizumab. Right. This should be given along with the methotrexate only. Right. Then we also have CD80 28 association hepatacept CTLA4 inhibitor hepatacept. Abatacept can also be given, but along with the methotrexate only, that too, as a third line drug. That when you can give these inter Nkinara interleukin 6 inhibitors or CTLA4, is that when maximum dose of maximum dose of TNF alpha inhibitors are not working, not working, that's when you have to go for this as a third line protocol management right after surplus uh, methotrexate to be, should be given in the patient then we also have another important drug tocilizumab and kinara ctl4 abatacept is present then we have jack1 and the 3 inhibitor tofacitinib and we also have a cd20 inhibitor rituximab which is usually given 1 gram daily for about 
two weeks to be given in the patient, that too, this rituximab is constantly very much effective in refractory rheumatoid arthritis. Very, very important. That too, in combination with methotrexate again, not alone. So, all these biological DMUNDs should be combined with methotrexate. So, I would say the best management for rheumatoid arthritis will be combined. Synthetic TMARD management, which is nothing but the one, two, three line of managements that I have set. So these are the biologicals, DMARDs, and uh, that is synthetic biologicals, and also, uh, sorry, synthetic DMARDs, and also biological DMARDs that are used in the patient of rheumatoid arthritis. Now I'll be discussing about the last. Uh, a bit of rheumatoid arthritis that is remission. So, remission is nothing but healing of rheumatoid arthritis. When do we know the patient is having remission? The patient is having remission when articular manifestations are nil, no articular manifestations, no extra articular manifestations, and no immunological activity in the blood. No immunological activity in the blood. That's when you can say the patient is under remission. Okay, but there is a certain criteria that we are using nowadays. That is, ULR criteria for remission is also present. What is this ULR criteria for remission? At any point of time, at any point of time, patient should be having less than one tender joint, less than one swollen joint. less than one CRP value and less than one patient assessment score. If every uh, all these points are present, then ULR criteria of remission is positive. right? Or there is another remission uh, criteria that is SDI should be SDI, remission SDI, not the disease activity SDI. So remission SDI should be less than 3.3. And what are the components of this SDI? What are the components of the SDI? Tender plus swollen joints, total 28 joints has to be examined in order to see either they are swollen or tender. Then patient assessment, global assessment index, is nothing but quality of life in this index global assessment and physician global assessment patient global assessment index physician global assessment index 0 to 10 is the values that we mark and crp should be less than 1 so these are the points that we need to consider as day for the revision if this is satisfied, the patient is under remission and we can go for decreasing in the dose of glucocorticoids and we can look for uh, stopping of exit. Now, I wanted to discuss the last point that is rheumatoid arthritis in pregnancy. But why do we need to discuss rheumatoid arthritis in pregnancy because as we have discussed at the first point of rheumatoid arthritis is nothing but females are most predominantly affected due to increase in the estrogen. So females having a very, very important manifestation in the lifetime pregnancy and multiple complications will be seen in the pregnancy. What if rheumatoid arthritis patient wants to conceive? That's the point. So they we can ask them to go conceive. Don't stop the drugs. Okay. The safer drugs for rheumatoid arthritis in pregnancy will be low dose glucocorticoids we can go for hcq and sulfasalazine sulfasalazine can be given in the females but not in the males because because if the uh, couple wanted to conceive and uh, the male patient is having uh, a rheumatoid arthritis then try not to give sulfasalazine because it causes infertility in a uh, few males um, which was a study based so these are the safer in pregnancy. This is these are the drugs that are used in acute flare of rheumatoid arthritis in pregnancy. But the interesting point is that, but the interesting point is that 
in pregnancy the episodes of rheumatoid arthritis will be decreasing joint pains will be decreasing other symptoms will be decreasing but post delivery again immediately the patient will be having flares high chances of flares will be present post delivery flare will be present so just in case if there is acute flare in the pregnancy you can use these drugs if the patient wanted to conceive you can use these drugs if the patient is having flare after post delivery you can use these drugs can we use methotrexate after post delivery yes you can use methotrexate after post delivery but after four weeks till then you can continue with this so because methotrexate and also leflunomide both are teratogenic in nature and they are secreted in breast milk yes so that's it for rheumatoid arthritis there are some extra 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 points are also there which are uh, there are certain extra extra points are also there which are useful for your exam uh, but there is a time constraint also uh, i desperately wanted to discuss uh, arthritis robustus predictors of uh, disease severity of the joint or uh, joint dysfunction which is multiple times asked in your exams so maybe if there is a chance or if there is time left for the next class i would uh, look into those points also uh that's it for rheumatoid arthritis i think you have got a clear cut idea if you have uh, any doubts i'll be staying five uh, online five minutes and uh, you can ask me your doubts anywhere that you haven't understood or anywhere you want me to repeat uh the points and also let me know how the classes or where i have to improve so i can improve it for my next class i just want your inputs yeah adelimumab is also uh tna falpen have that can be used yeah sulfa salicine is very much safe during pregnancy yeah provitella copri is uh, next to uh, ginger valley but very less very very less incidence very very less incidence you can forget it if it is put in the ncq uh, every point i think most of the points are derived from harrison uh, most of the points no i think 90% of the points are from harrison 21st edition no doubt at all the treatment but there are certain points i have included and uh, clubbed uh, here from rheumatology dm book also kelis rheumatology book also because some treatment protocols there is no much clarity uh, so most common ild is uip only and most devastating ild is organizing pneumonia in rheumatoid arthritis uh, hiv mycoplasma parovirus is what related to yeah hiv mycoplasma parovirus is not like related if the patient is uh, immunosuppressive right uh, there is a high chance these uh, viruses or uh, mycoplasma can directly infect synovial fluid yeah extra edge also <laughs> but um, yeah as i said there is a time constraint because i have to take your questions also is there something that you haven't understood yeah there are few mcqs at the end even that i couldn't discuss due to time frame where the all if all the class is understood these questions can also be understood so 30 year old lady visits our your clinic with three months history of pain in both her hands which cardiac symptom in her clinical history would you be most likely to see that would reflect an inflammatory arthritis such as rheumatoid arthritis now you can tell me the from the points that i have discussed so he was asking what is that one main point that could define it is inflammatory arthritis particularly rheumatoid arthritis a inability to extend and flex her fingers fully b inability to type because of pain in the fingers c presence of firm non tender nodules in the fingers and elbows c uh, marked stiffness for more than 1 hour in the mornings yes the answer is d which is very early early feature the patient explains and c is a late feature that we can see that is nodule presentation so don't get confused early morning stiffness is a uh, direct feature for inflammatory arthritis that too the patient should be complaining it for more than 6 weeks um so what else what else do you want for the next class uh, if anyone are online just 
drop in your inputs so i could make the next class much more better i just don't like the mcq based discussions to be frank because uh, you won't get you won't be having that uh, intuitiveness into the topic you have to know the topic the basics first there if it is really uh, uh, mcq based i couldn't explain the basics of rumnad arthritis where you don't know the disease process how it is developing and definitely have to mug up the x ray changes and mri changes that's why i have gone for this way of explanation sure 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 that was <laughs> my uh, technical problem from my end so 38 year old lady uh, mrs emily was referred to general physician because she says that for the last 6 months she has felt unwell and has suffered gradually worsening pain stiffness swelling and tenderness multiple small joints including elbows very small joints of her fingers and her ankles on examination these joints are swollen tender rheumatoid factor is negative most of the most uh, laboratory examination to confirm the diagnosis yes b has been answered by many and yes answer is anti ccp antibodies and you know how these anti ccp antibodies are developing also so that you can answer confidently so thank you thank you everyone that's it about rheumatoid arthritis so uh, i think the next class is on sle i guess yeah anemia so the patient here is having anemia and you can see it is a long standing chronic rheumatoid arthritis and definitely not due to dmrt treatment i haven't mentioned any dmrt treatment causing anemia or felty syndrome has a anemia of chronic disease but the patient haven't mentioned any uh, splenomegalovirus neutropenia not hemolytic anemia hemolysis we need lft yeah what about uip and nsap that you haven't understood in rheumatoid arthritis can you can you uh, brief uh my next class will be on 18th uh we'll have one more interesting session so the answer is c here see rheumatology is all about the basic immunology that you need to learn immunology is the most irritating uh, topic again so until unless you get lot of clarity on the immuno immunology you can't get the so basic idea of these major diseases no no i have covered lot of points only um, few points i haven't uh, discussed is the um arthritis robustus is one point i haven't discussed and the uh, prognostic factors for disease uh, joint deformities or uh, you know joint dysfunction i haven't dis discussed that's it i think those are the only points i haven't discussed which were asked in your competitive exams so here uh, uh, here also we can clearly see 57 year old lady rheumatoid arthritis who is on adalimumab and methotrexate comes to uh, comes for follow up she has complaints of fatigue and last two months she had fever weight loss six cases in two months which is uh, having drenching sweats no other symptoms are present their vitals are completely stable and uh, the patient is having hemoglobin 12.8 and uh, wbc 7.9 platelets 187 1049 sodium 138 potassium 5 creat 211 increased creatinine crp is normal chest x-ray normal blood cells is normal urine protein is plus 1 so here the chance of reactivation of tb very good tanvi das yes reactivation of tb because we have been using adalimumab which is a tnf alpha inhibitor and the patient is having fevers and weight loss which is suggesting of patient having a tb reactivation of tb okay then i'll be ending the session here thank you thank you so much for being patient with me here UIP UIP is common UIP is very common Thank you guys